Okay, I think we will make a start. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, coming back. We are going to talk a little bit about child and adolescent uh, brain development and mental health. Now, obviously, given your age, it was quite difficult for me to know among you there may well be some biologists and psychologists who will be going off to university to read these subjects. There may be people who are absolutely on the other side of the fence, who are humanities and don't know anything about this at all. So I've really tried to pitch it somewhere in the middle so that there's something for everyone. Um, a bit about my background. For me, this is something that I have come to later in life. So it's my uh, new direction, I suppose, my new thing that I'm trying. Um, I also was a humanities graduate to begin with. My teaching subject uh, is in modern foreign languages. But I decided through working with young people in London across many, many years on supporting them with their mental health that I would do a bit of retraining. So I'm currently a psychology student myself. I'm studying at university uh, when I'm not here uh, to uh, look at neuroscience of mental health. So I'm just going to share a few things that I'm learning about with you. I hope for many of you this will be new information, uh, but for some of you I do apologise if you already know more than me about this. Um, and what interests me about it is I think that it's something that isn't really discussed with young people, that there are things happening to you at the moment in your brains in terms of your development that are impacting on the choices you make and on your behaviour that you may or may not be aware of. And to my mind, knowledge is power. If you know what is happening, then you are able to act on that um, and adjust accordingly. So I would like to share that with you so that you know what is happening. And it's different to what is happening to the adults in this room. It's different, and that's why you are having different experiences to us and why we need to have those relationships and communicate with one another because the way you're seeing the world just isn't the way that we're seeing, seeing the world. And many of your teachers forget what it was like when we were your age, okay? Incidentally, we're going to be talking about early childhood and about adolescence. Um, and adolescence, in terms of brain development, goes up to about age 25. So if anybody has brought a young teacher with them for supervision, uh, they may still be going through this as well. So um, just have a look around. If there are any young teachers, they may be going through this with you, um, which is quite an interesting one. So what is happening in the brain during childhood? We're going to start with very, very early childhood and what's happening um, in the very early days from conception and what's happening as you go through your first years of life. Um, I'm going to show you a brief video so that we all start on the same level and I seem to have lost all my helpers so excuse me a minute while I put this on and this will just give you the absolute baseline and then we'll talk through it. So essentially, what is in this video, you'll lose out on the animations, I'm afraid, but you'll have to imagine, um, is what's happening in a baby's brain when it is born. So when that baby is conceived, before it is even born, um, the neural plate is forming in the baby's brain, and that's coming together to form two things. It's going to form your brain, and it's going to form your spinal cord, which is going to send all the messages around your body. And before that baby is born, all of that architecture has to take place. One of the reasons why it's so difficult to have babies as human beings is our brains grow very, very big. 
our heads grow very, very big um, in order to support such big brains. And by the time that baby is born, they will have 100 billion neurons already. What's a neuron? Are there any psychology students here who know what a neuron is? I think so, but I don't know if I want to share it with everyone. No, no psychologists? I'll assume you're too nervous to share. So a neuron is a nerve cell. It's the nerve cells that make up the brain, and they are connected to one another. Not physically, but very, very close. So you can see a little diagram I have put up for you of a neuron on the board. So this is the body of the neuron. Uh, these are the dendrites, which are little branches, and you can see them here as well. And they're reaching out here to another neuron. And there are 100 billion of these, and they're all connecting up throughout your brain. They are connecting to get you to do everything. So to get you to talk, to get you to move, to get you to remember all of the facts you need for your maths test. Every single thing that is happening in your body is because you have made a connection. And there's actually a gap here, so they're not touching, but there are neurotransmitters carrying messages between these two bits, so between the neurons. And what needs to happen is, although the baby is born with all of these neurons, they're not connected up in very useful ways. So has anyone had a baby in the family? Nephew, younger brother or sister? Few of you? When they come out, they can't really do very much, okay? They're not really very useful. They can eat, they can sleep, they can cry. They need to make all of these neurons, which they have, they're born with them, but they don't have very many useful pathways connected up. They've only got the really primary uh, bits of the brain, that reptile bit of the brain actually working, and during their first time of life, they need to connect up all of the different pathways. Are you going to go forward now? Please go forward. No? Okay, let's go down. Deary me, we're having technical problems, aren't we? Uh, so what's going to happen with a baby is they're going to come online and they're going to come online with just some key emotions in terms of their mental health. So can you, while I get the PowerPoint working, have a think about what you think the six emotions are that a baby has in the first six months of life. Off you go, six emotions. Okay, how many did you get? So, these are the six emotions that babies have. So, they start off with just a few, really. Even happiness is a bit of a difficult one for a, a brand new baby to express. They certainly have a lot of sadness. Most of that sadness is connected to their primary needs. Uh, they can have disgust, so babies are primed to like sweet tastes, even up into toddlerhood and childhood. If you give a baby broccoli, for example, it tastes much worse to them uh, than it does to us, and that gives them the disgust response. Uh, they have a lot of anger, a lot of anger when their needs aren't met. Um, fear, and then happiness comes around eight weeks of age. Um, and then surprise. Anyone ever played peekaboo with a baby? Babies like surprise, yeah? Um, so these are the primary emotions. So in terms of a baby's mental health, it's really quite simple. They don't have many emotions, only a few, not the complexities that we have as adults because they haven't made those synaptic pathways yet for more complex ones. And this is what a baby needs. Doesn't need to be a mother can be another primary caregiver, but for a baby to have good mental health, actually that's all they need. They need a primary caregiver, whether it's mother, whether it's father, whether it's a carer, who devotes themselves to meeting their every single need. Really quite easy uh, to look after a baby. However, if anyone has spent any time with them, they're quite challenging to be around, they're quite frustrating to be around. Um, 
and it's not always easy to meet their basic needs. So there are many campaigns that have started. This is a really interesting one called the First Thousand and One Days Movement for you to look up. And at the moment, you might be thinking, Miss, look, I do not want to be anywhere near babies for a really long time. But when you make that decision, if you make that decision, uh, you want to make sure that you are doing it right. And the first 1,000 and days is from conception all the way through pregnancy, birth, and then the next two years of life. And what happens in that 1,001 days has the biggest impact on your mental health of anything that will happen in your life. Now, it can be corrected, there are things that we can do, but if you've had real adversity in those first 1,001 days, so for example, if your mother had a lot of stress during pregnancy and it was a really difficult time, um, if you grew up and your basic needs of having enough food weren't being met, then that's going to increase how prone you are to facing challenges. And so it's particularly important that number one, if you're in a position where you are an influence on a baby's life or a toddler's life, whether or not it's parenting, whether it's being an auntie, uh, whether it's being an older brother or sister, that we're all trying to grow that baby's brain together. But also, it's really important that we all try and put into place some of the things uh, that we can do in order to improve our mental health if those first 1,001 days have had some challenges. And just to be really clear, I'm a parent too. This is very much about good enough. It's not about being perfect. There will be many challenges. There will be many adversities. That's one of the messages I want you to take home today, that challenge and adversity and difficulty is a normal part of life. But we need to have that good enough parenting during those first 1,001 days where we are being responsive and caring and that baby has an attachment with somebody in life who is going to put them at the center of it. So that's what's happening. So first of all, in terms of your mental health, have a think about that. What were your first um, couple of years like? Have they perhaps uh, given you some adversity which means uh, that you just need to pay particular attention to caring for yourself, showing that empathy and compassion um, for yourself as you go through life. But the interesting bit is what's happening to you now. So the first 1,001 days are the biggest explosion in brain development and in uh, synaptic connections in your life. So you start with those 100 billion neurons, but they're not connected up very handily. And in the first two years that you're on actually um, born and on the planet, connections are happening like crazy. You'll notice this, okay? Every single thing is a moment for learning. So all of those neurons need to start speaking to one another across the brain. And they're going to do that in certain ways. So they're going to speak to each other so you can learn words, language, obviously being um, at the level we have, it's something that's unique to humans. Um, they're going to learn movement, they're going to learn to understand emotion of other people. So by two, a child will understand if you're angry at them, or if you're happy, or if you're sad, they're going to start understanding some of those human emotions and human relationships. But 10 to 24 is going to be the next moment for you, where your brain is undergoing massive changes. Because all of those connections that are made turns out some of them aren't useful. We made connections all over the place, as many as we could, and we learned as quickly as we could, but some of those pathways aren't actually going to help you in adulthood, and therefore, they have to go. Because the problem with having a really big brain, like a human, is that it consumes a huge, huge amount of resource, a huge amount of energy, and therefore we need to run at that big powerhouse as efficiently as we can. So if we've made too many connections, we need to start clearing them out. And that's one of the things that's going to be happening to you if you are under age 24 at the moment in this room. And I should point out, it happens all the time. We're always building new connections and clearing out old connections. That's just something that happens. So for example, I apologize to any teachers who are mathematicians, uh, but I did well in my GCSE in maths when I was at school. I would probably fail it now because I haven't covered that material for a very long time. I'm, I'm an okay mathematician for my job and for day to day, 
but in terms of that GTC content, it's been pruned away. It's been cleared. It's not there anymore. So if I wanted to take my math GCSE now, despite doing well on it at the time, I would have to rebuild all of those connections. Now, it may be, I hope, that there are very faint pathways in my brain still to that cos and sine. And if I start working on it, then I'll reactivate them, open those dusty drawers, and my brain will say, oh, yes. I did know this once upon a time. There is a pathway. It's very faint. So let's rebuild it again. Um, but it might not. So what's happening is something called synaptic pruning. So that means those synapses, which are the gap between two neurons talking to each other, where messages are being passed, we're going to start getting rid of the ones that we don't need anymore. Okay, so that you can become more efficient into adulthood. So if you use a pathway, if you do GCSE maths and you go on to do A-level and degree and that's your career, that pathway is going to be super strong. There's a really good analogy of that, which is basically like building a bridge. And so you're building a bridge between your two neurons that are talking to each other. And if you're using that bridge all the time, it's going to become firm. It's going to become made of concrete. If you're not using that bridge, it's like a rotten rope bridge that's going to waste away altogether, okay? Um, so from age 2 to 10, you are reducing them anyway because 2 is the most you'll ever have. Even the most intelligent person in the world, age 2 is the time at which your brain has the greatest number of connections and then it starts to decline. But in teenage years, you're now starting to prune selectively based on your interests, based on your relationships, based on what learning drives you. And you're starting, and you've all done this because you're all GCSE age or above, so you've started that pruning, haven't you? Which subjects did you drop as soon as you could? You will offend some teachers in the room, I can tell you. Okay, whichever subject, you've started pruning that away. So those pathways in your brain are fading fast. And by the time you're more my age, those pathways will be faded away completely, potentially. Which subject were you absolutely desperate to pick for A-level? Think of that pathway. That pathway is going to get strong. And if you go to university, it's going to get stronger. And also, whenever we talk about brain development and neurons, we always talk in a really simplistic way in this vision, because it's easy, of one axon on a neuron talking to a dendrite on another neuron. Obviously, it's so much more complex than that. There are 100 billion of them. So the connections are multiplied in a way that we can't even fathom. So if you go on to study um, psychology at university, you're obviously going to have billions of neurons talking to each other about the specific learning for psychology, for example. And then the other thing that happens to you is you actually get more synaptogenesis, which is creation of synap uh, synapses, which is what the video that didn't work was about. Um, you get more of that now. So when you're a baby, connections growing, connections growing, stabilizes, we start getting rid of some because we've made too many and some of them were completely pointless. But at your age, you're having a really interesting time because you're making loads of new connections and you're getting rid of the ones you don't need. So your brain is busy refining itself into what you need for adulthood. And part of that refinement is making new connections. Part of that refinement is getting rid of the ones that we don't need anymore, okay? Maths, didn't need that, forget it. Um, but also part of it is something called myelination, which is where your connections become fast. And that's a really important bit. So you get a fatty coating that goes round the neuron, and that means that the neurons talking to each other are speeding up. So essentially, you're turning your brain into some sort of Ferrari that you're going to need. That's in my brain from earlier. Ferraris don't make you happy. Um, but that's what you're turning your brain into, okay? So you want only the connections you need, and they're now pr uh, priming themselves for adulthood because they're becoming super quick, which is something that in childhood you didn't have. So what that means is teenagers have the best of both worlds. And I'm sorry to tell you, but this is why we put you through a lot of exams, because your brains are in a really good place for learning. Because you have a child brain, 
which is very plastic. Does everyone know what I mean by plastic when I talk about brain? No. So plastic means that it is very adaptable. So your brain is very adaptable. It can build connections, it can get rid of connections, just like that. So when I pump you full of new information, for me that will be French vocabulary, you can learn French vocabulary probably quicker than I can at this age, okay? Because your brains are very plastic, they're very easy to change um, and build new connections. But you also have the advantages of the adult brain. So your brain is good at making connections a long way apart, so understanding how to link concepts together, and it's good at doing it really quickly. But if you remember, at the beginning, I said that one in 10 teenagers would have a mental health difficulty. So if you have this amazing brain, this superhero brain that is the best of the child's brain and the best of the adult's brain, why? Why do you have such difficulties? There's other things happening as well, and those things aren't quite so helpful. So here we have two images. I like these blue shiny ones, so they're not the most scientifically accurate, but they're good. Um, so we have two images of your brain. And there's a big difference between what all the teachers in this room are doing and what you're doing. So your brain is focused, I'm so sorry to say, on this tiny little piece here. As a teenager, that is where most of your decisions are coming from. Even visually, it doesn't look great, does it? So that is your amygdala. You actually have one on each side of your brain. And that is basically where we have um, looking for threats, looking at emotional responses to things. That part of your brain is basically driving fight or flight. And it's a part of the brain that more primitive animals than us rely on all of the time. So as a teenager, that tiny nugget, I'm sorry to say, is in charge of your decisions right now. As an adult, that bit is in charge. And what you are doing as teenagers is you are trying to move from that side onto that side. What age will you get there? 24, 25, that's when you're going to get there, okay? So on this side, you have the prefrontal cortex, or PFC, which some of you may have heard of. And that is in charge of executive decision-making, okay? Evaluating, judging, determining, all of those higher-level skills that actually animals won't necessarily have at all or not in um, the same sort of level as us. This bit is what we have in common with all other mammals, but also reptiles, various other things, okay? Um, and so, unfortunately for you, you are going to be more inclined to making decisions that are gonna put you at risk, for example. And why I share that with you, if you remember what I said at the beginning, is knowledge is power. It doesn't matter how grown up you think you are, it doesn't matter how mature you are, this just is happening and it is true. So you might as well be aware of it and use that knowledge to support you. And sometimes, by the way, I should point out, it's not that you don't have this, you do have it. It's just not in charge yet, okay? Um, what you need to do is you just need to take time because the amygdala will react just like that because linking to what Tom Telford said before, that's your fight or flight, survival in the military, uh, if your life's in danger, that part of your brain. So it's really important. I mean, you do need it. But if you just wait a bit, and I'm afraid to say a bit longer for you than for an adult, if you just wait a bit, your PFC is there, it is able to control, but it just isn't as good yet. It's learning still, okay? So you just need to give it a little bit of time. And so sometimes, rather than going on what your gut instinct is, just take some time, talk to a friend, talk to somebody else, and let your PFC have the additional time it needs to make that executive decision. Because you want this to be driving the car. You only want this to be driving the car if there's a lion chasing you, okay? The rest of the time, you need to try and divert to the PFC, and that's just gonna take you a bit of time and a bit of practice in order to get there, okay? Um, so these are all the things that the PFC is responsible for. Uh, as you can see, let's just have a little read of this. I'll give you a minute. 
Adults, please think about how good you are at all of these things. And students, just have a think about how good you are at all of these things. Just 30 seconds. Have a chat to the person next to you. Okay, now, I really hope, teenagers, that you didn't do yourself down. That's one of the themes of today. Obviously, you can do all of those things. There shouldn't be anything on there as a teenager where you're thinking, whoa, I can't do that at all. You can do all of it, okay? But you are just practicing some of it, and it will take you until age 25 uh, to be able to default to that rather than always defaulting um, to emotion. And obviously, you know, you're going to have days and weeks and months and times of your life where you find it easier to get your PFC in charge and times when you don't. And when you're under increased stress, when your mental health is low, when there's a lot of cognitive demands on your brain in general, it's going to be much harder for the PFC to be in charge of your responses to situations when it's trying to process too many different things coming in. That's just really hard. So another thing that is going on for you is something to do with neurotransmitters. So those are talking between two different neurons. And there are two that you've probably heard of, dopamine and serotonin. And they're both really, really important for mental health. And unfortunately for you, you have lower levels in adolescence than you do at other times of your life. So again, that's going to increase your tendency to find situations challenging. However, you can do things naturally to increase your levels of dopamine and increase your levels of serotonin. Okay? So dopamine is associated with pleasure. It's associated with motivation. So as teenagers, you're going to find it just that little bit harder to get motivated. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean you're not going to be motivated, but you're going to have to put more energy into it, which is just tiring. Um, and serotonin is basically the happiness chemical in your brain, and that, unfortunately, has decreased as well. Um, serotonin, incidentally, is what is um, impacted by if you're on antidepressant medication. So if you're on antidepressant medication, uh, that will mean that serotonin stays in your system for longer, your naturally occurring serotonin. But there are things that you can do. So serotonin, for example, being in the sun and doing exercise, those things can increase your serotonin. It's just generated in your brain. So although your baseline level is low, you can make more of it. Dopamine is all about um, getting rewards. So you can get rewards in your life and that's going to increase your dopamine. So eating healthy foods, for example, um, or achieving things. Dopamine can also be triggered unhealthily. Does anyone know how dopamine can be triggered unhealthily? Yeah, drugs. So drugs of abuse can also affect dopamine. But the problem is, is in the long term, that's going to have significant effects on your neural circuitry. So short term, it will give you a rush. It will give you a hit of dopamine, and that will feel good. Long term, it's actually going to have an impact on the circuitry of your brain and its responsiveness to dopamine, and it's going to dampen that down. And that's why people who are addicted to drugs that impact on dopamine, they need to have more and more and more to have the same hit because your brain is trying to get and stabilize itself back to normal. So if you're abusing the dopamine circuitry in your brain, then what's going to happen is your brain tries to suppress it, you then need to take in more, and you end up in a vicious cycle. So, there are things you can do to hack your happiness chemicals, and we're going to talk about uh, that. But at the moment, I'm afraid as a teenager, they're just naturally a bit low. So, you need to maybe put in more work into that self-care than you do as an adult in order to stabilize yourself. So, teenage brains, in summary, you are great learners, and that's why you are in school right now, because you are in the perfect time of your life for learning. You will learn pretty much anything quicker than the adults in this room at the moment. You are absolutely primed for it. You have super strong connections building in your brain, and you're getting rid of the useless ones, but 
you are often very impulsive because the amygdala is running the ship and it shouldn't be the PFC should be running the ship in human beings. And that is going to prime you for risk-taking behaviors, uh, which could be all sorts of things. So everyone always thinks, oh, risk-taking, you're talking about alcohol and drugs. It can be that, but it's not for a lot of teenagers. Um, it can just be, you know, even silly things like last minute deadlines and thinking that you can pull something off and you can't pull it off, um, you know, uh, classically happens at university actually, even more so than at school, where people decide that they can stay up all night and write an essay. What age are they? They're 18 and 19. Their brains are priming them to think, it's fine, I can leave this to the last minute and I will pull it off, okay? Don't do it when you go to university because you also need a lot more sleep as teenagers. Has anyone ever told you that school is at the wrong time for you? Yeah, all the teachers know this, but we like school at the time it is because it suits in with our family lives and the rest of society. We all know that this is not the time that you should be in school. You should be asleep until about 10 o'clock and then you should come to school. Please don't be late for school because I told you this, but we just need to be aware of that. And actually, again, knowledge is power. Just being aware of the fact that in the mornings for you is often not going to be when you're at your best because your brain is working late into the night compared to an adult. You've got melatonin not being released at the same time as an adult and then your brain is not going to wake up and kick into gear again until much later than the adults. So think about that particularly when you're revising over half term, those of you who might have trial exams uh, coming up afterwards and just think about actually if mum and dad are saying to you, you should be up and early in the morning, get up at six, get up at seven, get on with your day. It doesn't work for you. On an individual basis, it may do. But globally, for adolescents, it's not actually the right decision for you. So what can you do in order to help with this? Obviously, avoid drugs. As I've said, um, you'll have lots of speeches about that. But as I said, it's just bad for the dopamine circuitry in your brain. So even if you're facing a lot of peer pressure and risk-taking behaviors, being a part of your brain circuitry, just be aware it will be doing damage and it does more damage to you if you do it now than it will if you do uh, this when you're 30 years old. So actually the impact is going to be significant because your brain is remodeling. So think about that. If your brain is building connections and pruning connections, and in the middle of that, you start throwing in some crazy chemicals into the mix. Trust me, it's quite busy up there already. It could really do without you doing anything to disrupt that development of your brain. Uh, sleep a lot and just talk to your parents about that. You need more sleep than we do, okay? You need more sleep and you need it at different times. Um, what you don't need to do is have your sleep at funny times. So try and keep on a, on a level playing field. So don't sleep until two o'clock at the weekend. You can't catch it up, um, but you do need more sleep. So please indulge yourself in that. Uh, eat well. I didn't have time in this speech, but there's some amazing research out there about foods that help uh, memory. Uh, there's a TED talk on it by someone called Sandrine Thuret, T-H-U-R-E-T, and she has done huge amounts of research at KCL um, about which foods impact on the hippocampus, which is the center of memory in the brain. So if anyone wants to look up that TED talk and ask mum and dad to buy you some things to help with your exams, uh, genuinely blueberries will help you remember for your exams. You wouldn't believe it, but they have actually done uh, quite good, robust studies um, and blueberries will help you revise for exams, so who knew? Um, have positive relationships, as we've said already, so in terms of configuring your brain, you're not doing it on your own, so you have to build those connections and as a teenager, they are more important for you than they are for adults. And that brings us back to everything we've said about lockdown and the impact on you was more grave because your brains are primed for social interaction with other people your age. You are supposed to break away from your parents at this time. Parents hate that. You must do it. It is part of growing up, okay? And finally, hack your happiness chemicals. So think about natural, healthy ways of increasing dopamine in your brain 
natural, healthy ways of increasing your serotonin levels. If you are not exercising because you are too busy, start doing that. That's the easiest way to increase the amount of happiness neurotransmitters flowing around your brain. So it's something where even if you think you should be revising, go for a run for 20 minutes first. You will honestly reap the benefits of it. Uh, and I think that's it. So what we're going to do is we're going to break...